Hello everybody and welcome back. And today is Losh Dane, the ninth of Tharmont. And it is the day after the fight. And the weather is clear, dry, warm, with a light breeze. That sounds almost perfect. Very different from the night before. And as I said last time, we're going to use this as a day of rest. After the fight was over, we cast whatever healing spells we had. The next morning, we're going to cast again whatever we need and use the Staff of Healing. And today is a good chance in this day of rest, well, to tidy up, clear up all the dead goblin bodies from around the outside and the upper balcony. And it's also a good chance for the party to get to know this family because when we met them, we were rushed across this bridge. We then were ushered inside quickly and then spent the entire night under siege. There were some breaks, a couple of hours here and there in between fighting, but it's not conducive to getting to know people. The atmosphere today is quite weird. There is a sense of relief that it's over and people tend to indulge in a bit of humor, even if black humor, when they are relieved. But there is the obvious tragedy of the stable hands being killed the barn and the bridge and the gatehouse being burnt and there's also questions as to what is going on so we might as well just explore all these different rooms because the module has gone into a lot of detail about where the party are and what they're looking at right so we've got the bridge and the gatehouse and the barn they're burnt we have the main hall and we're told this is the heart of the home this is where people gather and have their meals if the adventurers stay at Sisuskin, they will be expected to sleep here. Straw mattresses will be provided. We're quite happy with that. The hall is a gallery on an upper floor level. This contains long table benches, Piotr's large chair on the wall, a stuffed eagle and a wolf's head, an old hunting horn and two tapestries. One shows wild running horses and the other has a geometric pattern. There's a side room here, and this is for washing of clothes, storing of salted meat. There's probably game birds being cured, and Stelios, the servant, he sleeps here. This is the kitchen, a very warm place. The cat tends to hang around out here. We have number seven. This is Taris, Piotr's son, and Alfana. We haven't seen much of Alfana. She and Masha and Stelios and Matvey the boy were ushered away from the fight into this room here. This is Piotr's and Daria's room. And all the rooms are given a rating of one to three using symbols of privacy. And these are extremely private. We're not expected to go there. Room number nine is a storeroom. This is at the base of that four story tower. 10, the next level up is the armory. And I believe it was Taris or Daria who shot arrows out of here into the courtyard. 11 is Kuzma and Irina's room. This is marked as extremely private, yet we use this as a place to launch arrows from. In the middle of a siege, privacy be damned. Kuzma is the old grandmother, and Irina is Piotr's daughter. So this is a grandmother-granddaughter setup, and Kuzma is an old cleric, and Irina is in training. And this room contains two potions of healing. When we set off on our adventures, we will be offered all of this. And we've got 12 upstairs, which is the battlements. We know them well. 13 to 16 in this corner is the stable block. We've got a forge. We've got a tack room. We've got Hakos and Masha's room. Hakos is dead. Masha is his young bride. And we're told, and this is quite sad, this room has a bed, a cot, chest of clothes, table, mirror, baby's toys, a balalaika hanging on a wall. Now Masha does not want to stay in this room because look how vulnerable it is. So she's been pitched up in this upper balcony with her baby. And Novanas' room. This is marked as extremely private, but he's dead. And we have 17, last of all, the stables. And there are 11 riding horses in these stables. Hey, that's quite cramped because each square is only five feet. And therefore there's two horses for every five feet. And so we spent the day in the hall, eating, wandering around. We've been through the woods. We've found the remains of the goblins. 
and we found that amulet that belonged to the Yellow Fang goblins. So that gives us a lot of questions as to who are these different tribes and what are they doing. Here are the eight internal pull-out sheets. Pull-out sheet one to eight. And it has been noted that only the first two have the words player information sheet. Pull-out sheet one and two. Though if you were to give the players just this page here, you would have to tear it or cut it from the rest. And who likes tearing up their books? I don't know. So while yes, strictly speaking, this is all that the players get. I suppose they can get this calendar. But they would also get this because I personally wouldn't want to tear this off. Let's look at some of the non-human clans that we've encountered. We've encountered the Wolf Skull Goblins, the Red Blade, the Viper, and we've had an indication that the Yellow Fang are also involved. These tribes do not normally get on well with each other, and as we've seen, the Vipers ran off with the horses. The Wolf Skull abandoned the siege just before dawn, and the Red Blade, well, their leader was really pissed. And the Yellow Fang, well, what were they doing there? So this is giving us a lot of questions to ask, and we begin to tie it in with our very own first encounter, where the party were attacked on the boat by, as it turns out, the Iron Ring slavers. Piotr and his family can fill us in with these details here, because they know this area, and we can fill them in on the Iron Ring slavers, because of our experience with the Eye of Traldar. So even though this is a day of rest and healing, there's a lot to do, and there's a lot to think about, and it was also a day to get to know the family a bit better. All days of rest must come to an end, and the next day is Solidain, the 10th of Thamont, and that is the day we set off to look for the stolen horses, and the tracks for the stolen horses lead eastward. Right, so the party set off the next morning, and the weather is good. It's slightly cooler than yesterday, but it is sunny and clear and dry. I need to fill in a bit of backstory. This adventure began in Kelvin after we left Specularum. We do have our own pony, by the way, and we took our pony to Kelvin, and that's where we met Stephen, who gave us this commission to begin with. Stephen is Piotr's brother. These people are very good with horses, so our poor old pony has been left in Kelvin to be stabled for what we thought would be about three days. Well, probably won't see her for some time. We also took some gold with us. There is a bank in Specularum, and we've taken about 50 gold pieces and 50 silver pieces each. So that's just 350 gold and another 35 worth of gold in silver. So it's the 10th of Thamont. And Taras, Piotr's son, is accompanying us on this journey. He's the one who seems to be most determined to get these horses back. He seems to be a bit of a hothead. Piotr is a bit more circumspect about losing them. He's not happy, but that has to be weighed up with the experience of trying to rescue them. But, but he gives in to Taras' insistence that they at least try something. There are horses for all of us. So we all, on horseback, follow the goblin trails eastward. And this is not difficult because they stole 41 horses and 41 horses make a lot of hoof marks. To the east of the homestead was a clearing, then the forest. And the tracks break out of the forest and hang around the edge of it, but in the open and travel around here. Now this is one, two, three, four, five hexes away. That's 15 miles according to the scale and we're on horseback at about six miles per hour, five at a canter or a trot. It'll take us about three hours to get to this area marked W2. We have wilderness encounters and we're told to roll for a random wandering monster encounter in the morning and in the evening. 
And you're also advised to pre-roll them so that you don't spend too much game time rolling these things up and also to judge where and when it would be appropriate for the encounter to happen. I pre-rolled a open day encounter and I got an 11 and that was refugees. Refugees, the adventurers encounter a small group of refugees who have fled from one of the homesteads or other settlements ravaged by the goblins. And I'm going to say that considering this is where Cherkass is and considering we met them here, these are refugees from Cherkass. Now that by coincidence is the same place that Katarina, the woman with the yellow dress is from. And I'm going to say that one of these refugees, 4 to 9, that is 1d6 plus 3. So that is 6 refugees, one of these is Katarina. And that's at least some good news, but of course that means Cherkass was attacked and did fall to the goblins. And this just raises more questions. Why are these attacks coordinated? And why are they attacking all these homesteads? And why are all these separate clans working together? But we send the refugees on to Sakuskin, and this just leaves a problem of where will they stay and how will they be fed? They may have to go on to Calvin after a few days, but as hospitable and as good and kind as Piotr's family are, you know, they don't have a bottomless kitchen to feed everybody. But we continue on, and we encounter this. Right. It seems you were not the only ones to catch the horse thieves, for in the muddy clearing before you, the goblins have been attacked and massacred. The stripped and bloody bodies of a score of goblins lie mixed with the torn carcasses of horses. Oh no, that's bad news. And the obese corpse of a tall goblin hangs by his feet from a tree. Okay, this wasn't just a massacre, this was some sort of like revenge. But even now the goblins have no peace. Six large beetles are feasting on the remains. Without a moment's hesitation, they scuttle towards you. It looks like they prefer live meat to dead. Alright, well, we don't have time to assess this massacre. We have something to do. I'm gonna say what happened was we came across this clearing and from the height of our horses and from some distance we could see all the dead bodies everywhere so we got off our horses and led them carefully towards this muddied field to examine what's going on let's roll for surprise there is no surprise let's roll for initiative and the beetles get initiative there's six of them, so that's two on Taris, Donard and Carrick who are at the front. We've got Sylvia, Liz and Malin at the back. Now they need to make two rolls each. This is 12 rolls altogether because they do two attacks. They have their bite attack and they have their poison attack. So green is the color of poison. So two on Taris. Right. Now they hit AC3 and Taris did indeed get hit by the burning oil. Let's remind yourself of an oil beetle. Three foot long giant beetles that sometimes burrow underground. An oil beetle squirts an oily fluid at one of its attackers. A hit roll is needed and a range is five feet. If the oil hits, it causes painful blisters with a minus two thackle penalty for 24 hours. I don't need the damage roll, but Taris's Thaco is at 20. That's quite debilitating. And the second beetle on him. Misses both times. Right, so there are two beetles on Donard. Right, and the green one, it's AC minus one, and he gets burnt. So Donard's Thaco is up to 15. Not happy, but he doesn't take any damage. And the second beetle on Donard misses. No, there's two on Carrick. That misses. And both of those miss. Okay. Argo. 
Archery. Liz. It doesn't do great damage, but she shoots the one which is on Donard. It's down to five. Liz. It does much better damage, and she shoots the one that's on Taris, and it's down to four. Malin is going to try and throw a throwing dagger, and he misses. Beetles are quite well armoured. They have an AC of four. Right, now let's do... Donard. Who still hits with his thackle of 15 and does 9 damage. He kills 1. Let's do Taras. Right, his thackle's 20. He hits AC6, that was a miss. God damn it, he would have hit and killed. And let's do Carrick. Who misses. Right, that was round one. Round two. We get initiative. Right, let's do archery again. Liz misses. Sylvia misses. Malin misses. Right, melee. <laughs> Donard. Hits and kills the second one that's on him. Liz hit at first and he does d6 plus 4 damage. So yep, it was at 5. It's now dead. Taras. Hits AC4 this time and does 5 damage. He kills the damaged one that's on him. So we have 3 of them dead. And then it's up to Carrick. Who misses again? Oh dear. Now with three of them dead, I'm going to do a morale check for these beetles. And that's an eight. And their morale is eight. So they pass their morale check and it's their turn. So there are two on Carrick. First one misses. Second one misses. There's one on Donard who misses. And one on Taras who hits both times. Right, it's another three points off Taras. Uh, he's down to 12. Okay, so his Thaco is 22. Right, so it's round three. And they get initiative. So there's two on Carrick. First one misses. Second one misses. The one on Donard hits for another Thaco penalty. So yes, his Thaco is down to 17. <laughs> right, okay. One on Taris. And they both miss. Right, it's our go. Right. Liz misses. Sylvia misses. Malin with a throwing dagger. Yep, he misses. Donard misses. Taris misses, unsurprisingly. And Carrick. Misses on wise up round four. They get initiative. I'm not enjoying this fight. These beetles are hungry. That's one on Carrick misses. Second one misses. The one on Donard misses. The one on Taris oh, poisons him again. This guy is just covered in blisters. <laughs> right. Okay. Now it's our go. Right. We'll do Liz. 
And she misses, we'll do Sylvia. And she misses, we'll do Donard. Who misses? We'll do Taris. Who misses? And we'll do Carrick. Who not only hits, but finally kills the one on him. So, ah, I was throwing for too many. There's only two left. Luckily, the extra one that I was throwing for was on Carrick, and that imaginary one didn't hit him. Okay, so it's round five. We get initiative. Liz hits and kills one. Sylvia misses. Donard oh, completely fumbles. You can't get worse than that. Taras, who probably needs a natural 20 to hit, misses. And Carrick, Beetle Cleaver, hits and yet again kills another one. Right, so we've got six dead beetles. I am definitely going to use the Staff of Healing on both Donard and Taras to cure those blisters. Poor Taras looks like he's just had a bath and paint stripper. Anyway, that's that fight over. As we were fighting, a character in a tree, a small female goblin, drops down and runs away. Now she's too far to capture, but did she get surprised when she dropped down on us? A roll of one or two. Yes, I'm afraid that she was able to drop from the tree and that was a surprise for us and by the time we saw her she had already scuttled off and we were fighting the beetles. Okay, we're going to survey this battlefield and we've got 22 dead viper goblins identified by their distinctive cheek tattoos, three wolf skulls and one dire wolf. Again, Taras knows what these symbols mean. Only 17 of the original 41 horses were killed. That's still quite a blow. That's 17 dead horses. Not happy. Especially Sylvia isn't happy since these white horses are the symbols of her clan. Even though she's been quite a gentle, kind person, she's starting to feel angry. The tracks of the wolf skulls lead southwest, cannot be followed very far before they peter out. Hmm. Now where do we go next? The Viper's Goblin Trail leads into the woods after a few miles, so we're going to be following that next. And we are on riding horses, which have a movement rate of 240 feet. We're told that to turn that into miles per day, you divide that by 5, so that is 48 miles per day. I'm going to say that a day is 16 hours long, because you have to rest for 8 of them. So if we divide the 48 miles by the 16 hours, we have 3 miles per hour, and we have done 12 miles. In other words, 1 hex, which is 3 miles, is 1 hour of travel in clear terrain, and we've done 4 hexes, so it took us 4 hours to get to this battle scene. We spent 1 hour fighting beetles, curing ourselves, and examining all the evidence. So that's five hours. We set off at about eight o'clock, so that means it's one in the afternoon. We're going to take a quick bite for something to eat. And then we're going to follow the trail through the forest. Now we're told that when you go through a forest, the travelling speed is two thirds. So three miles an hour becomes two. And we've got one, two, three, nine miles to cover as we follow the trail. And at two miles an hour, that is four and a half hours. So, it is late afternoon before we come to our next encounter. And we do indeed follow the trail of the 24 remaining horses. And, well, we find them here. And what do we find? Well, that's for next time. Okay, so I'll see you then.